So welcome everybody and thank you so much for being here this evening for this Tea Time Talk, Bang Bang Shoots the Buses, Thomas Dudley and his legacy. Tea Time Talks is a series of talks run by 14 Henrietta Street in Dublin 1, inspired by the history and of the building and the people who lived there. Uh, 14 Henrietta Street is now a social history museum which tells the story of the building from when it was a Georgian townhouse to when it was a tenement. And it's run by Dublin City Council Culture Company, which runs cultural in initiatives and buildings across the city with and for the people of Dublin. And this talk is really inspired by one project we've done in particular, an oral history project called Your Tenement Memories, um, where we've been lucky enough to hear from people who have memories of Dublin's tenements and Bang Bang came up time and time again as um, those of you who know about him can imagine, he was spoken of very fondly. So we're delighted to celebrate that this evening uh, with, this, with this event. Uh, my name is Kate, and in a moment, I'm gonna hand over to our speakers for this evening. But uh, before we begin, just so you're aware, there will be a chance to ask questions towards the end of the event. And you can type questions into the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as we can towards the end. And this is also being recorded. So if you have to go halfway through or you have a friend who couldn't make it, you can watch back at a later date on our channels. And um, what I will do is put a link to our newsletter in the chat box during the talk. So if you want to be, um, uh, if you want to hear about when those are available, you can sign up to that if you want as well. So um, our speakers today are Donal Fallon and Daniel Lambert. Donal is a historian, lecturer, and author based in Dublin. His publications include a biography of Major John McBride by O'Brien Press and a history of Nelson's Pillar by New Ireland Books. And he also presents the Three Castles Burning podcast, which is well worth a listen if you haven't already. And Daniel Lambert is the co-owner of the Bang Bang Cafe in Fibsborough. In 2017, the cafe raised funds to erect a headstone for Thomas Dudley um, in St. Joseph's Cemetery in Drumcondra. And he's also the chief operating officer for the uh, Bohemian Football Club, which explains his surroundings this evening. So um, without further ado, I will hand over to Donal and Dan. Uh, hi, folks. Thanks very much for coming along. Uh, this is a very different format from most of what we do in, in these kind of talks. Uh, today would be, I suppose, largely uh, conversation driven between myself and Dan. Uh, I'm a great admirer of what Dan has done uh, in, in Fibsborough in terms of building a sense of community, both with the cafe and, and his work with uh, Bohemians Football Club, or Bohemian Football Club, I should say. Uh, and I really just admire the way he's brought kind of Thomas Dudley back uh, to consciousness, along with other people in Dublin, uh, as we'll get into later on. A remarkable character. In the beginning, I suppose, before I start talking to Dan, I want to do a kind of quick overview for anyone not too familiar with Thomas Dudley. Who is Bang Bang? What is uh, a Dublin street character? Uh, you know, where do these people fit in the life and the identity of the city? Then we'll kind of open it up into a, a conversation. And I'd really like if people, if they have memories of Bang Bang, recollections just before we came on, Pat Gary, one of our guides, had some brilliant little anecdotes about Bang Bang. And if you have those kind of stories, please do throw them in uh, later on. The idea of the Dublin character has always fascinated me. I think every urban environment, every city uh, has its street characters. But in trying to understand what is unique about a Dublin character, I think the historian Lucy McDermott captured any notable eccentric who was visible, a familiar part of the landscape, tolerated and valued for his or her eccentricity. I think Dublin characters, uh, we probably had a unique abundance of characters because of the scale of the city. I mean, New York City has characters, London has characters, but Joyce, when he described Dublin as the Hibernian metropolis, I think tongue was kind of firmly in cheek because Dublin is more of a town than a metropolis. And I think the small scale of the city has very much contributed historically to people like Bang Bang, you know, emerging as such characters. Mm -hmm. Everyone knew them because everyone encountered them. You could not encounter them in such a small city. And the writer Mary Collum in the early 20th century wrote that between Abbey Street and College Green, a five minute walk, one could meet every person of importance in the life of the city at a certain time in the afternoon, which is very true. And when you talk about Bang Bang, inevitably, as, as we'll get into later on, you end up talking about the other characters who occupied the Dublin uh, of that time. You know, people like Harry Lemon, Forty Coats and the like. On the subject of Dublin characters, I've always loved the quote from John Ryan in his book, Remembering How We Stood. 
I think it captures the fact that these people are often around us and we, we, we're not conscious of them when they're around us. Dublin was a town of characters then as now, and I suppose will ever be. A man I knew was taking a stroll down Grafton Street one day when he happened to overhear part of a discussion which three citizens were having outside Mitchell's Cafe. The gist of their dialogue was that they were deploring the absence from the Dublin scene of any real characters. They appeared to be genuinely aggrieved. They were, in fact, Miles Nagopoli and Sean O'Sullivan and Brendan Bean. <laughs> the city was awash with characters at the time when John Ryan wrote that in the 1950s, which is, of course, the time of Thomas Dudley. For me, the great forerunner to Bang Bang is Michael Moran uh, or Zosimus. I think he is the, if you will, the page one, chapter one of Dublin Street characters. Uh, born in the Liberties in 1794, he became Dublin's premier ballad monger. He recited poetry and songs on Dublin streets and bridges. And as the historian Kevin Kearns has wrote, a tired and long frieze type coat and cape, soft brown beaver hat, baggy corduroy trousers and black torn stick, he would traipse about spouting eclectic ballads to an in, in, enraptured audiences. But when I thought about this coming up to this talk, one of the things about Zosimus that strikes me in terms of why he was a character is the fact that he was blind, you know, that there was a certain uh, vulnerability about him. And I think that's also true uh, of Bang Bang. I think what made some people characters in the life of Dublin was that they performed, you know, in a sense, Moran performed poetry, uh, recited songs on, on street corners and bridges. Bang Bang entertained, he performed theatre on the streets. But just like Zosimus, there was that sense of vulnerability uh, about him, which I think contributes uh, to, to his place in the city as a character. Uniquely for a street character uh, joined only by Zosimus, Thomas Dudley is included in the Dictionary of Irish Biography from the Royal Irish Academy, which is kind of amazing. It's a very kind of prestigious academic publication, Taoiseachs, architects, musicians and revolutionaries, and an entry on Bang Bang. His entry concludes that Dudley was one of the most familiar of many eccentrics whose presence on Dublin streets was a significant feature of the city's character, charm and image. I think it's quite remarkable uh, that a street performer of, of a sort like, like Thomas Dudley could go on to inclusion in something like the Dictionary of Irish Biography. I think it says much about his unique standing and the identity of the city. So, Bang Bang is born Thomas Dudley uh, in 1906. We find him in the census of 1911, uh, filled in by his father. They were living in Clarence Street North, Mount Joy. Uh, interesting census for a couple of reasons. I mean, it gives good insight into the social class uh, of the family. His father, John, uh, was a chimney cleaner. Uh, his mother, below, uh, cannot read, unable to read. So born into a very kind of humble working class family. Uh, his father died when Thomas was very, very young uh, indeed. And he was later primarily raised in an orphanage uh, in Cabra, later living in Mill Lane, the Coombe. The writer and the poet Dermot Bulger, author of a brilliant play exploring Bang Bang, correctly notes that any Dubliner I ever met who was a child in the 1940s, 50s and 60s retains vivid memories of this street character who jumped down from open-backed buses to instigate imaginary Wild West gun battles. It's a time when Dublin was expanding very rapidly, suburbanization, you know, you had new suburbs, uh, the expansion of what was already there, like Crumlin, but also new suburbs like Ballyfermot, a bus network connecting an ever-growing city, uh, and Bang Bang availing of that. I think it's worth saying that at the time and in the decades before, there was something of an obsession uh, with cowboys and westerns in Dublin. Uh, Bang Bang, on his deathbed, uh, well, he never called himself Bang Bang, but Thomas on his deathbed alluded to the fact that it was a love of Westerns uh, that began it for him. I think the, the Western really was exploding in popularity uh, in early 20th century Dublin because of the cinema. Uh, by 1922, there were 37 cinemas in business in Dublin, which is extraordinary. James Joyce opened the first one, the Volta and Mary Street, a good idea before its time, uh, unfortunately. But Westerns, in the time that Bang Bang is operating in the city, having these kind of mock shootouts with people, uh, are the most popular genre of film with Dublin youths. One cinema in the 50s is popularly known in Dublin as The Ranch, because basically all it shows is cowboy films. There are great recollections of Bang Bang from various sources and different writers. I pulled two that I think are, are particularly nice. Um, Isabel Smith, the writer. We reached most places on foot, and often encountered Bang Bang on our travels. He was an old Dublin character who staged mock shootouts with the passing public. 
His 45 was a long church key worn tin and shiny, which he aimed at people who in general participated in his good natured antics by returning fire with their finger, taking cover in doorways, even clutching their chest and falling down dead on the city streets. Paddy Crosby, in his great memoir, Your Dinner's Poured Out. My father was very fond of him and seemed to come across him very often in different parts of the city. He told us about one incident with Bang Bang in Marlborough Street when the shooting pretense went on for nearly half an hour and some visiting Americans joined in. They thought the whole thing was hilarious. So I love the idea of just business just stopping for half an hour as everyone gets involved uh, in one of these fictitious shootouts. In latter years, Bang Bang was in care in a home in Drumcondra, uh, owing to worsening vision. He died in January of 1981. Uh, he lived in a, a flat in Bridgefoot Street uh, in the years before that. And we'll talk about that a little bit with Dan because the story gets kind of tragic uh, towards the end. His passing was marked by the Irish Independent, uh, front page news in the Independent. One of Dublin's best known and most beloved characters, Thomas Bang Bang Dudley, has died in the home for the blind. He was 75, an institution in Dublin during his lifetime. But uniquely, perhaps, for the Dublin street character, Bang Bang was acknowledged uh, before passing. Uh, the 1970s in particular, there's a couple of things that happen. A play in the Abbey entitled From the Vikings to Bang Bang explored the story of the city. Uh, and the popular historian Eamon McAmosh also did a lot to increase uh, awareness of him and really befriended him. Uh, Eamon McAmosh, remarkable character. Uh, no mention of the words Bang Bang. He told me he'd rather be called Lord Dudley. In the latter years of his life, his preferred name. McAmosh wrote what I consider one of the greatest Dublin history books, Me Jewel and Darling Dublin, and included Bang Bang in it, which was interesting to include a living character. It was the first book ever published by O'Brien Press, uh, and he wrote it in Mountjoy Prison. <laughs> he was the editor of a Fublox, the Republican newspaper. McAmosh joked that James Joyce locked himself in the tower at Sandy Cove for 12 months to write his book. I don't see much difference between the tower and Mountjoy. But I think it was Eamon McAmosh more than anyone uh, who popularised Bang Bang as a public figure. Also, Pete St. John, the balladeer who wrote The Marrow. Uh, I didn't know this. Dan told me before we came on that uh, this song was written at a time when Bang Bang was still alive. Uh, brilliant song, verse by verse, goes through the various characters of kind of uh, mid-20th century Dublin. Con Martin, the, the great football journalist. Uh, Brendan Behan gets a mention too. Nelson, Nelson's Pillars there as well. Uh, but Bang Bang is a reoccurring character in the song. We all went up to the marrow. Hey there, who's your man? Alfie Byrne out walking, sure, he's a decent man. Bang Bang shoots the buses with his golden key. Hey, hi, diddly eye, and out goes she. So this kind of recognition of Bang Bang as a cultural figure uh, begins really in his own lifetime, which is quite nice and quite unique for a Dublin street character. In popular culture and memory in recent times, he's popped up in some remarkable ways. Uh, a Grammy-nominated rock band have used him on the front of a seven-inch single. Fontaine's DC, Liberty Bell. Uh, Dermot Bulger's great play, Bang Bang, uh, really entertaining, performed by Pat McGrath, uh, published recently uh, by Dublin City Council Culture, Culture Company. Leo McGee, uh, who works in the archive and library on Pierce Street, a great champion uh, of Bang Bang, has written a great poem uh, in, 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 his, in his memory, uh, and a series of beautiful little murals around the city. Uh, I love these. I think it's a great idea, a great initiative on the part of the, of the City Council, trying to bring colour to something that is very grey and boring. You know, traffic light boxes and electricity boxes, uh, at least two of them that I'm aware of dedicated uh, to Bang Bang. Bang Bang's key, as I mentioned on display in Pierce Street uh, Library, in normal times you can go in and visit it. Uh, in the absence of a kind of civic museum anymore, there's some great little artefacts in that library that tell the story of Dublin history. The head of Admiral Horatio Nelson uh, is one of those items, but so too, Bang Bang's key. If you ask nicely, they might let you hold it. And before I open up into conversation uh, with Dan, I think it's worth ending with these words for, from Dermot Bulger in his introduction to his play, Bang Bang. Street characters appear from nowhere and disappear into nowhere. They become so much a part of the backdrop of our lives that we cease to notice them until one day we notice their absence. It is impossible to explain their role in the rich tapestry of Dublin life to new generations who never heard of Bang Bang or Johnny Forty Coats 
or other characters who populated our streets, leading lives of once colorful and sad. So I'm going to ask Kate to bring up the image of Stan's brought forward. Dan, I suppose the, the first question is, uh, I know there's a connection between the area with, with Cabra and the orphanage and, and, and Bang Bang, but what was the central inspiration for, for you uh, in honoring Bang Bang by naming, naming the cafe uh, after him? Um, really, Donald, I suppose when we, when we were setting up the shop and the cafe, it was important and it's, it's probably evident there in some of the iconography there in the background, I suppose, with dubs against racism and shoes bohemians and not, uh, not shareholders. Uh, we wanted to have a, a name that I suppose meant something was representative of, of something and ultimately had a, a sense of place and a sense of identity. I think too often, um, whether it's bars, cafes, shops, they go with generic names and generic interiors that ultimately don't represent the place they exist in in any way. And you could be in Dublin or New York or Berlin. So uh, it was, it, we had a couple of conversations, myself and my sister. I can't, I, I'm pretty sure it was my sister, Grace, who suggested Bang Bang. We both would have known about who he was from, store, from hearing the Dubliner songs. And I think my granddad used to tell us about him. And, um, you know, that was really important. And when you hear the name for it, it's, it's obviously uh, memorable. Uh, you know, you hear young kids coming in for hot chocolate and they can say bang, bang. As soon as they can say mommy or daddy, <laughs> which is good for business. But uh, but also now, look, at you know, when you mentioned there, he, he grew up in an orphanage in Cabra and, and uh, he ultimately, you know, he's buried in in, the, in, uh, in Drumcondra. So we're kind of halfway between the two. So that was the inspiration. And um and I suppose not not too long after after we opened, it was just an absolute chance conversation. There's a, a guy called Graham Hopkins who lives in Chandon, close to close to the shop. And uh, his father uh, is friends with a man called Joe Tyrrell. And uh, he he just happened to say one day that he buried Bang Bang. He was the he was the guy who dug the grave and uh, he knew where he was buried because he put a mark on the wall. And um, and that was remarkable. I just, you know, if someone say that and and he and it was real, you know, it wasn't a tall tale. He he was the guy. Um, and we just instantly thought, well, you know, we'd like to go down there. So he he left the cone. He said, look, pop down anytime, I'll leave a traffic cone at the spot. And uh we took a trip down one day. It's not far, it's hard to find actually. It's it's kind of been built around now. Originally, originally um the cemetery called St. Joseph's, I think, was on the grounds of Clon Turk House. It's now at the back of a place called Child Vision, where there's a, a kind of a petting zoo. And a new housing estate so it's kind of boxed in um but it was just sad to go there and think you know what I, how many people knew bang bang and his life and to have this unmarked plot so uh the sign in the picture there is the sign we put up and the response was really amazing i think we a kind of thousand euro came came in in kind of 24 hours and what was really nice about it was a lot a lot of older people kind of came in taxis and buses and got lifts from from family members and they were keen to tell his story so uh that's kind of how it came about did you find that unexpectedly the the cafe kind of became a, a a place of kind of oral history or social history that people wanted to share stories with you? That was just not something that you envisioned would happen with Bang Bang. Definitely, yeah, definitely. In the picture there in the background, you can see the large blueprints, um, which actually was done by a guy called I'm pretty certain that's a Colin McGinty print, and I think that the late Colin McGinty, I'm pretty sure, but. Uh, but underneath that, there's a, a photograph. It's hard to see there in the photo, but that was one that somebody had posted in. And we actually got lots of letters in as well, people with stories from the US and the UK who'd seen the piece. It was on RTE News afterwards when we did. We'll talk about the gravestone probably in a couple of minutes. But yeah, lots of people. And lot, a lot, awful lot of people came over who just wanted to talk. I remember one man really clearly, and he had this brilliant story. He was sitting outside. He, he's probably about 80. And he said that uh, he used to cycle into work every day, and he was a keen cyclist. And he said... Uh, People talk about, um, you know, protecting the environment today. He said, we were already doing it in the, in the 50s. We all cycled. And he said yeah. uh, that O'Connell Bridge would be like the start of the Tour de France, that everyone would be lined up and the, the guard would raise his hand. And he said he was on the bridge one day and he liked to get, a, get off ahead of everyone else. And when the guy held up his hand, he went to cycle and his bike didn't move. And Bang Bang was standing beside behind him and was holding up the back wheel. <laughs> and uh, lots of stories like that. Really nice to hear. And um you know, it was just a generation of people who, who you know, were, were pretty elderly and they'd come in to give to give money. And, and that was it was a really nice thing and nice to be a part of those stories. Can we see the, the plaque? So a couple of things about it that I that I really like. Uh, it doesn't I, I'll, I'll let you explain, but it doesn't have the normal iconography of something that you'd see in a in a church cemetery. And you went along with including a line from uh, from Pete St. John, which I think is 
is really, really nice. But it's not a headstone as such. Uh, I notice it's described in some of the newspaper reports of the day as a, as a headstone, but Thomas being buried in a, in a pauper's grave, that was kind of an impossibility. And this was, this was the option before you. Yeah, so we had to get permission. Obviously, with something like this, there was the, the Franciscan order there. And um, it took a while. To be fair, they were they, they ultimately said yes, and there was no there was no uh, issue. I think they just had to go through a bit of a hierarchy to get permission. And they said, yeah, as you've mentioned, you know, there's numerous people buried buried in this plot. So just to put it on the wall uh, right beside where he was buried, which is what which is what we did. And uh, yeah, like you mentioned, we just and they normally have a cross, but they, they, we thought the key would be a, a bit more fitting. And uh, and just to put on it, really, the, the the line that it was erected by a group of ordinary Dubliners, and that was important mm. because it really was a large number of people each gave a small amount of money, but with a lot, a lot of love to make it happen. And, um, you know, and, it, and, and to fondly remember them, everybody who, everybody who donated had their own little story. So uh, it's nice that it's there. And as I said, you know, Joe isn't a young man and, you know, he was a, he was a person who buried him and, and it, it kind of got to the stage where there was probably a short enough window that was closing to, to do this and, and to have a permanent piece there is, is really nice. You seem to use that Pete St. John song, The Marrow, uh, a little bit with the cafe in other ways too I've seen it on kind of some of the bang bang uh, merchandise what kind of draws you towards uh, that song it kind of tells it's a story of, of the city doesn't it yeah totally I think it's well first of all it's a brilliant song you know it's it, it, when, when you hear it you, it stays in your head it sticks with you like any good song will but ultimately yeah like the, the characters that are mentioned in the song it, it kind of has a real sense of place and time about it and, and it sort of brings you back to you know to to a Dublin of 40, 50 years ago. And uh, I, I just, I think it's a brilliant song. And what was really nice on the day was uh, Dara Lynch from, you know, formerly Lynch to now Lancome, Dara came down and uh, and he sang the song uh, at the at the unveiling of the plaque. And that was really nice of Dara. And it gave it a real sense of occasion to hear such a, you know, a brilliant folk singer of, of today, um, you know, sing, sing a song made famous by the Dubliners. And, and in a large part, uh, you know, that, that references Bang Bang, that was a nice touch. And it's the same author of, of um, The Fields of Atten Rye. Like, it's just an incredible creative output, Pete St. John. But I love the, the conclusion uh, of the song. It's true that Dublin's changing since the pillar was blown down by the winds of violence that are buggering up the town. We used to solve our differences with a digging match in a jar, but now they're all playing bang, bang, and that's going to bleed and fire. It kind of, there's a sadness in it towards the end of how Dublin is, is changing. And one thing you told me that I didn't know was that there's a certain tragedy in the very latter part of Bang Bang's life where he's kind of, the city's changing, drugs are a problem, and, and he's kind of taken advantage of in, in some ways. Yeah, and I think what's funny about that song, and you mentioned the line there, is that line sort of indicates the end of a period of innocence. Maybe, you know, if you can draw comparisons, maybe people could leave their doors unlocked and can't, and maybe it changed from, the, you know, the, the normal fight in a pub and the shake of hands to somebody maybe being, you know, killed or, or seriously injured with gunfire. And I think that... Ultimately, you know, towards the end of his life, you know, I need a report you read say that heroin was coming into Dublin and and he was obviously, you know, an innocent character and that people began to take advantage of the fact that he, he lived alone and had an inner city, you know, flat and, and people were coming in, storing drugs, uh, you know, administering drugs and taking drugs in his, in his flat and they'd buy him bottles of stout and he was oblivious to it. And uh, I think for his, his own safety and his failing eyesight, he was obviously taken into the Clonturk house and. Um, so yeah, you know, there's kind of similarities there between the end of that song and really in the the uh, towards the end of his own life that the innocence of the city was being lost and maybe you know he lived through a period. I think what's brilliant really, and he used to say he used to say that the key came from Hitler himself when people <laughs> asked him. He, he he called it his cult forty five, and most people said it came from a church, but he said it came from Hitler. But uh, he really was, I suppose, he was the star of his own show, you know. And, and what's great about about Bang Bang in many ways is that when, you, when we talk about the other Dublin street characters and street characters globally, normally their kind of, their fame is derived from a kind of a darkness. So, you know, the hairy lemon, a heavy drinker, or maybe it's somebody who's homeless, or today it could be a drug user, but Bang Bang, there was no darkness to it. You know, the, the guy, you know, he, what he was engaged in was something that was purely, it, it seems to be somebody who, who continued to play, you know, yeah. throughout his life. And, and that's something that I suppose, you know, if you can continue to play throughout your life, you probably maintain a high degree of happiness. And, uh, you know, he, and he brought street theater to a whole city and he was the star of, of the show and guards would, would play with him. There's a brilliant story that uh, he was driving down, uh, he was on the back of a bus, as, as apparently he often was, going down O'Connell Street and the bus turned the corner and he fell off the bus. 
and everybody stopped, you know, and today he, he'd be, uh, he'd be probably end up in court. And he, he looked up, held his hand up and said, carry on, I'm only wounded. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and that has so many elements of that. And when you think of today, we, as you move through a city, you know, you read accounts of Dublin before Bang Bang's time and there's talk of opium dens and she beans and, and it sounds so exciting. And today you walk through and you sort of, you know, see a homogenous city for the most yeah. part and you see homogenous streetscapes and, uh, you know, cities are pretty boring today. Uh, it's pretty homogenous, pretty sanitized. And he brought a sense of mystery and excitement that it's probably hard to, to, to imagine today. And to a city that was a relatively poor city, um, yeah. he brightened up people's days. And, um, you know, I think that that's really nice. It's worth to think if Kate goes on to the next slide there. Um, on the day, Michal, which I thought it was really nice that as Lord Mayor, Michal McDonagh, you know, is, is a really good good person. I've dealt with him on lots of issues and he's, he's a great, uh, great insight into Dublin history. And Michal came down and there he is shooting a key. And uh, it was nice that the Lord Mayor came down on the day to acknowledge Bang Bang. And I think just on the next slide as well, um, Pat McGrath, and you mentioned Dermot Bulger's play. Pat's a, a brilliant actor. Uh, and I think Pat, Pat lives in, in Cabra. I, I see him around the area. He comes into Bang Bang. And we got this bus from the Transport Museum in Hoth. Uh, it would have been a bus that Bang Bang probably traveled on. It's from that time. And, and Pat gave, uh, we had the key from the city archive there. And uh, Pat acted out the monologue there. And it was a really good day. It was a rainy day. So uh, that was unfortunate, but everything else was perfect. And uh, it's a nice photograph that. It's actually just been just been published, uh, Bang Bang and Other Dublin Monologues by, by Dermot Bulger. It's really, really funny and has great heart and soul. That's kind of everything Dermot writes does. But in the introduction, Dermot kind of makes the point that, you know, we have to ask if the city has changed to such an extent that would a character like Bang Bang be tolerated today? Or would a character like that be somewhat shunned? Or do you think the kind of eccentric characters of the mid-20th century would be, would be viewed with a kind of suspicion of sorts even in, in Dublin today? Yeah, I think, I think they would. And I think it's hard to figure out why that is, isn't it? You know, I remember looking at a really, it was a famous study and it looked at crime rates in an English city and parents' attitudes to letting their kids out. And, and kids are allowed to go in this city 95%, uh, you know, decreased range than they used to. And the reason parents gave is that, oh, you know, the world is dangerous. Ultimately, crime is lower in this city today than it was then. So why is this that we've less characters? Is there, a, are people less likely to engage with them out of fear. I, I don't know the answer, but one thing is for certain we don't. It's we, we had a conversation before we came live here. It's hard to pick out a Dublin character of today and the city has more people than ever. Yeah. So uh, that's an interesting point. Why is that? Are they are they brought away from public view? Are people less likely to engage with them or, or is it a mix of other factors? It's hard to put your finger on, but they are a loss to, to the city for sure. And, you know, characters that brought in up people's day and that added an element of uncertainty or an element of excitement and take away from that kind of monotonous kind of environment that maybe a global world has brought us there. They're a big loss. I know the push pull media, which you're uh, involved with a media company produced a great documentary around the Bohemian Shamrock Rovers Derby and titled it's Ozimus. Uh, <laughs> we talked, why was that? And you're kind of drawn to Dublin characters in, in the broader sense than just, than just bang bang. What, and why was which Donald? Why, why is Ozimus? To be, well, Jamie called it Zosimus. I think what the, the indication was there was around League of Ireland. We mentioned it too, is that basically League of Ireland is one area where there does seem to be characters. There are firm characters in League of Ireland. League of Ireland is a re relatively countercultural activity. I think, you know, it's, it certainly hasn't been for the masses. And, and uh, you know, and I'm saying that as a huge League of Ireland fan. Um, but you think of people like there's Barry at Bowes and there's, you're a St. Pat's fan. I know there's a guy at St. Pat's with a bell and there's Cork Tom. And it seems that League of Ireland has managed to keep these people and, and then you, you draw comparisons when you think about Dublin has changed a lot. League of Ireland grounds haven't. It's very often like walking into the 1950s going into a League of Ireland ground and the characters are still there. So maybe the, maybe the sense of place is what keeps them. But uh, it is one area yeah, where, where the characters still still remain and, and long may that be the case. Tom, who you mentioned there from Cork, uh, kind of hitchhikes his way across the, the country and you can, you can see him on a Tuesday night in Donegal at a, a Finn Harps game Friday in... Richmond Park in Jakar, and if Rovers are playing on the Saturday, he'll be at that as well. It's incredible just the way he traverses uh, across the country. He probably is one of the last street characters that you'll encounter uh, in Ireland. Yeah, no, I think you're totally right. And Tom, for anyone who knows League of Ireland, they'll know who Tom is. The players know who Tom is. I don't think he ever pays into a game. He's normally going in the media gate. And I think I mentioned to you, when you see him, he, he doesn't seem, he's actually from Kerry. Everyone calls him Cork Tom. <laughs> he, uh, 
he, he wears a different club coat each time you, you see him. And it seems that when he's, you know, when he's in Daily Mount, if you were to give him a, a Bose coat, he'd, he'd bin the coat he's wearing and wear that one until a new one arrives. <laughs> and, and that's brilliant, you know, that uh, it, it's kind of, it's, it's obviously uh, a, t- a total, t- he's a total character. And, uh, you know, League of Ireland and why that's happened, there's probably a study in, in there in itself. Uh, one of the things I, 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 I kind of forgot about it because like you, I see it all the time in, in the house and I play it all the time. And I, I, I only at the last minute, I just put that in, uh, was the Liberty Bell cover from, from the Fontaines. Uh, they kind of remind me of the Smiths, in the, not musically, but in the sense that the Smiths in the 80s used all those great Mancunian uh, iconic images, you know, Coronation Street actresses, uh, Sheila Delaney, all that kind of stuff, and popularised that sense of uh, local identity. The fact that the Fontaines, like that a band nominated for a Grammy would stick Thomas Dudley on the front of a seven inch single uh, and then later uh, uh, Johnny Forty Coats and then that great image, two Dublin children uh, have, having, a, having a smoke. Do you think that they have gone some way towards uh, bringing that kind of history back and that sense of identity back? Yeah, I think absolutely, absolutely, Donald. It's a brilliant point. And I think that what's really interesting about the Fontaines is uh, for the first trees, I should mention very luckily, actually, they used to rehearse on Enniskerry Road, which is right beside Bang Bang. So the band would have come into, into the shop, into the cafe uh, very regularly. And because we were called Bang Bang and he was in the cover, they gave me a couple of copies. That they're now quite valuable on Discogs. <laughs> but, uh, but I did notice that they're self-released before they were signed to Partizan. I think the covers are Johnny Forticoats, Bang Bang and The Glimmerman. Uh, really great imagery. Uh, and hats off to the Fontaines for pulling that out there because it does, you know, people, the Fontaines are really successful and brilliant Dublin band. And, you know, when you bring iconography like that back, people do look into it and they do then, you know, rediscover a part of the history that they otherwise wouldn't. And I think that it's uh, it's it's quite interesting. I've often thought, why did they put Bang Bang on the front of the cover? I've never asked them, but, you know, they were, they'd met in the Liberties, you know, a couple of them were studying in the Liberties. I know Tom, the drummer, was living on Thomas Street. Uh, and, you know, it, maybe it was this sense of place that they were now in the in the area where Bang Bang was most known. Um, it would be good to, to ask them that, but I think they've played a, they played a great role, really. A lot of their iconography later on as well, when you look at, I think, the image from Duffy's Circus, you look at the um, hero's death and you look at the, you know, the, the, the statue in the GPO of Cucullin. These are brilliant, brilliant, uh, you know, pieces of history that are really gateways for people in to discover subjects. And, uh, and a band that can do that, I think, uh, really adds to their, their legacy in time. And what they put out there with, with younger fans. The album cover, as you mentioned, is Oliver Shepherd's the, the death of the death of Cucullin. And uh it was really strange watching the, the Grammy Awards and seeing something from the GPO, you know, that we, we see all the time in Dublin, like blown up on screen. It was just really, really surreal, really, really surreal. This event, I remember this event uh outside Bang Bang. It was kind of one of the first kind of such events that you'd done, but you've kind of taken that ethos and, and run with it since. There's been other kind of community focused events and, and, and fundraising through the cafe for for good causes you kind of see uh bang bang as being an integral part of, of fibspray in a broader sense as you try and do a buzz yeah it was really important i suppose you know when you exist and, and we do like that's a, a, an absolutely residential area there's no other commercial units beside us and we really tried to to have something that that ultimately tried to have a positive was a force for good and had a positive impact and as as bohemians does and i think we you know, we've managed to, to raise money for a whole range of causes, cause inner city help and homeless, the Irish traveler movement. They played, we were quite active in, in the repeal movement. And um, I suppose the one that's really stood out is the last couple of years, they, they get gifts for kids in direct provision. And I think through the shop, we've raised maybe about approaching 200,000 euros there in three years, huge amount of money. And and the the social media pages of, of the shop rarely uh, feature any, any food or goods that we sell. They're normally social causes. And uh, they've managed to attract quite a, a big audience. And, th- and that's great to use, you know, to use what is, you know, it's a commercial operation and it does need to provide for the staff and, and, and you know, and that, that, that's first and foremost, provide employment and good employment for people. But then to be able to, uh, you know, to have a positive impact and raise issues and, and try and try and do some good in the city, uh, you know, it's really important. And um, thankfully, the, the shop has managed to do that and, uh, and long may that continue as well. I'd love to open it up to anyone who has any kind of uh, recollections would be especially welcome questions. Uh, we'll take them too. While we're waiting for them, I should say briefly, the, the project, Your Tenement Memories, we're hoping to, to roll that out again. Uh, in, in essence, what we did is we traveled across the city uh, to kind of the, the suburbs uh, and interviewed people about their recollections of moving out uh, from Dublin's inner city, from the tenements, 
But what ultimately emerged within a lot of those recollections were, you know, very strong characters, Lugs Brannigan, uh, Garda Jim Brannigan. Uh, I don't think anyone will call him Lugs Brannigan to his face, but Garda Jim Brannigan uh, was one. The animal, the animal gangs, that kind of stuff uh, emerged a lot too. But certainly Thomas Dudley Bang Bang was one of the recurring characters. And often when people were talking about the 50s and the 40s, uh, what came through was a lot of recollection of hardship. You know, people talked about the years of the emergency. They talked about things like rationing, uh, you know, the hardship of the 50s. Uh, but Bang Bang, what was so unique, I think, about the way Bang Bang came forward and so many people's oral uh, history recollections was it was entirely positive. You know, it was one of the one of the abiding positive memories people had uh, of, of growing up in Dublin. Uh, in the 1950s, together perhaps with, I think, the cinema, uh, Bang Bang, and actually, ironically, football. Football was another thing that came up all the time as a, a positive memory following the likes of Drumcondra, Shells, Bose, uh, and the like. So the inspiration to do this today and to talk to Dan about, about Bang Bang and marking the, the, the burial place was uh, the, the presence of him in so many of those interviews. Brilliant. Thank you both so much. Um, oh, it was really, really interesting. And as Daniel said it's um, your opportunity now to ask any questions you might have so you can use the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen and we will read those out. Um, there's one here from Una already. Um, are there any references to Bang Bang during the 1916 Rising or lockout or was that a bit before his time? Before his time and, and that, is, that his father died in 1913 uh, in the year of the lockout is, is interesting but he, he was uh, a, a chimney cleaner so he wasn't a member of the Irish Transport General Workers Union uh, wasn't entangled in the in, in the lockout uh, in, in any way. Thank you. A uh, question from Dave. If um, You might have mentioned this before but um, we should have dedicated stamps for characters of history. What are your thoughts on that? It's a great idea and it's a uh, it's totally do. It's totally doable. There, there's a very good process by which you can write to one post uh, and suggest someone for a stamp. And there's a committee, I think, in somewhere in the GPO, a committee about a committee. But there's a committee whose job is to go through these proposals. And uh, you know, if if it, it can happen, your idea can be turned into a stamp. I'm always meaning to write to them and suggest one for Herbert Sims, uh, the, the housing architect, for the corporation in the 30s and the 40s. But uh, yeah, especially if you, if you can tie one in with, a, with an upcoming anniversary, that always helps. There was a really nice one last year uh, to mark the centenary of the munitions strike when uh, dockers and railway men refused to handle British uh, military goods or to allow soldiers on trains. It was just a simple stamp honouring honoring that, you know, a moment of kind of quiet enough heroism during the War of Independence that was, that was largely forgotten. So stamps are a, a, a really nice way of commemorating people. We see them all the time you know more people will see a stamp than we'll see a picture in a gallery and uh, i think a stamp a series of stamps honoring people like uh, like thomas dudley uh, johnny forty coats and the like is a really really good idea dan i know there was a display of bohemians in the stands most of our heroes don't appear on, on stamps yeah yeah no, i think it's a brilliant question and i think yeah stamps that link back into local history and and uh, and you know um people like bang bang a brilliant idea and, and it, I was aware that, that did, you mentioned the, the idea that you can send in and people should really engage with that process. It's there, engage with that from the bottom up and try and I, I'd love to see when you mentioned Amy McTomash earlier on, you know, the uh, local defibrillator here, the, the Mount Joy helicopter escape in Halloween night, 1973. You know, we're coming up to an anniversary there in 2023 and it was a great image the next day because uh, when they were lined up, uh, Amy McTomash was asked, they were asked, uh, you know, what happened? And he said, oh, which came down on our broomstick and three men jumped aboard. I think... Uh, a broomstick with three men on it would look brilliant on a stamp and to mark these kind of quirky events and people, uh, I think that'd be great. <laughs> I've just put the link in the chat there for uh, the OnPost page where you can make suggestions for stamps. So if anyone wants to do that, then uh, do go ahead. Uh, another question here, does Bang Bang have any living relatives? Well, for you, Dan, sure. did, did you encounter yeah. any? No, and we tried to, we asked, I, I don't think so is, is is the answer there or, or if there is maybe they, they don't know you know do, i'm not sure don't if the census mentioned a bit siblings but um we thought they would have come forward it would have been great if somebody had to come forward but the at the time it was covered on 6-1 news and things so it got kind of proper national coverage and you would imagine that if there was a, a known relative that they would have come forward so unfortunately it seems that if there if there are they don't know it um so that's that's sad there's a couple of questions about the other um, characters you mentioned. So the first one, 
Another notable character was Dancing Mary, who sang and preached around town in the 80s. Lovely, gentle, happy lady. Do you have any info on her? And then someone else is asking about um, the Dice Man. Would you consider the Dice Man a Dublin character? I know he wasn't really from Dublin, but he would be seen on Grafton Street. Yeah, um, the Dice Man, Tom McGinty, is most certainly a Dublin character. And there's been... Uh... There's a couple of little kind of tributes to Tom in, in interesting places. There's a plaque in Meeting House Square uh, in Temple Bar, which is very hard to find. That's a challenge for everyone listening in. Dice Man's Corner in, in, in there. And that was meant to be a place where a corner of Meeting House Square where street performers would go, buskers would go and the like. But I don't think it ever really became that. So I'd love to see something to, to the Dice Man on Grafton Street. When I think of the Dice Man, that's what comes to mind for me. Tom McGinty was a Scottish... Uh, actor of, of stage who came to Dublin and kind of advertised things in street performance so he worked for the uh, dandelion market for a period there was a game shop in town uh, I think it was called the dice and he became the dice man promoting it but he's a much loved character and crucially important character in, in Dublin history for various reasons one of which was that he was he was gay uh, he had AIDS and he went on television and spoke about living with AIDS and he really opened the discussion uh, around that and the street traders of Grafton Street took him to, the, to, to their hearts you see a great image of his, his coffin uh, going down Grafton Street and, and uh, all the traders just stop you know and the flower sellers are throwing flowers uh, on top of it so uh, an incredible character uh, Tom McGinty like every time you walk through town he could be something totally different day to day uh, he could be a character from the Rocky Horror Picture show one day uh, and the next day he could be a sad clown once he was a giant condom he could be absolutely anything and I think Tom deserves something in the city. And a documentary on Tom would be great. Maybe someone should open a cafe called The Dice Man on Grafton Street. And Dancing Mary, Mary Dunn uh, from Dunleary. She only died actually in 2014, uh, 87 years of age. But yeah, many people would remember her. I think people remember the, the dancing more than they remember uh, the preaching. But she was kind of largely left alone and, and entertained, even through kind of very vicious uh, campaigns and, and times of division in the city. You know, referendums and things like divorce, which just tore Dublin asunder. But Mary was kind of, despite whatever she was preaching, kind of left her own devices and, and, and treated just as an entertaining dancer rather than a, a preacher, which was, I think was the right way to approach her. Thank you. Um, Marion also asks, uh, did Bang Bang ever have a job? And uh, was he ever homeless? You said he lived in the coom at one point. Yeah, I, as far as I know, he didn't ha have, a, have a job. Like, he seemed to spend a lot of time in cinemas, so he definitely was interested in, f in film, and obviously he was obsessed with, with, um, with Westerns. Funny enough, when John Wayne died, he went around telling everyone for months, my old pal is dead. Um, so, he, you know, he seemed to... And I think he, he was born I, possibly on the same day or very close to John Wayne. I could have that one wrong, but I, I think that's the case. But um, he doesn't seem to have done all my... No, but I, I don't think he did have, have employment, or it's not recorded if he did. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, totally, totally right. Thank you. Um, there's loads of questions coming in here. So, um, as Akira asks, are there any books you'd recommend on Dublin characters? Uh, well, Bulger's book is just out. Uh, there it is. It's really nice. And the cover is actually Pat uh, McGrath outside Bang Bang acting in that role. So, that's just published by Dublin's Culture Connects. And I, I just, I, I love Dermot Bulger as a writer. I think he has a great uh, affinity for, for the city and for Dubliners, and it's really touching, and I recommend giving that a read. Uh, Kevin Kearns, the oral historian, wrote a lot of great books about, about Dublin. Kearns is an American historian who would kind of travel to Dublin every couple of years and, and uh, interview people. And he produced these great books of oral history, one on Stony Batter, uh, one on the history of Dublin women workers, uh, one on Dublin pub life and law, which is a masterclass. But Bang Bang and other characters emerge in those kind of uh, oral histories. They're really, really interesting. The people kind of, I think maybe because Cairns is an American, people kind of told him more uh, on one level. They kind of opened up to him as, as an outsider. But uh, I really recommend Kevin Cairns' books and you get a great insight into just what it was like to be in Dublin uh, at that time. You know, we, I think it's remembered as a very grey time in some ways, economically and uh, people talk about migration. The only, the only time you ever left Dublin was to emigrate. But on another level, it was a very playful time. And, and that comes through in, in, in recollections of Thomas Dudley, especially. There, there is too, there's a, there's a book, it's, a, it's, it's short, some great illustrations in it. I can't remember the, the illustrator's name. I think it's a, it's a Dutch person. But um, Bobby Ahern, it's called Do You Remember Your Man? 
and uh, ultimately Bang Bang is featured in that. There's kind of a page or two on each of the characters with a really good illustration. And that's a really nice just kind of coffee table book to flick through as well. Some of them are just so funny, like, you know, people were given nicknames based on whatever they, they, they said or did. In the case of Thomas, it was he didn't ne he never called himself Bang Bang, but he went bang, so everyone called him Bang Bang. One guy, damn the weather. He came across it in the book. He just went around town all day saying, damn the weather, damn the weather, damn the weather. So he became damn the weather. Uh, a guy called Bally Shannon who went down Thomas Street just shouting Bally Shannon at people. Like, it's, it's funny how people, these names were, were bestowed upon them. It's absolutely fantastic. It's very Dublin. Like. Well, that leads us quite nicely on to the, to the next question. Quite a few people have asked how you think Bang Bang would be um, uh, treated or reacted to today. And you touched on that a bit in the discussion back there. Uh, Phil in particular says, uh, inspiring project and I'm fascinated as to why characters no longer exist in any community. Have we all become so politically correct that society feels the urge to treat eccentrics like Bang Bang rather than allowing them to bring joy to the streets? So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, personally, I'd agree with that. I think it's a fine, <clears throat> you know, there's a fine line here, obviously, like, you know, if somebody has a, a mental health issue, which, which Bang Bang probably did, uh, you know, it, there is obviously treat, there's a degree of treatment required. I'm not a mental health expert, but also then, as Phil has said there, you know, if you take people away and you heavily medicate them and they perhaps live, you know, enclosed in an institution, um, is that good for them and is that good for society? Um, and, and our thing is perhaps too black and white and the, the gray area for people to exist and, uh, you know, and, and kind of express themselves, um, even in a way that might be seen as different to other people. Uh, is that preferable for a society? And I think it probably is. So I think maybe Phil's point is correct. And we've maybe gone too far in terms of control and not allowing space for people who are different to, to the norm to kind of uh, to have their place in society and, and be celebrated for that. And a kind of follow-up question from that, uh, from Fergus. Um, interesting to hear you talk of a relative lack of Dublin characters now um, with Aidan Walsh, the only one that comes to mind. Can you put this down to anything? The master of the universe and the king of rock and roll, Aidan Walsh, an amazing character uh, in his own in his own way. I saw that when the Pope went down to the, the Capuchin brothers on, on Church Street, Aidan was there and he's in the pictures of the Pope. Kind of pops up in sometimes surprising places. Aidan was a great a great character. Yeah, I, 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 I'm convinced, and I think Dan probably agrees with me on this, that it's primarily a question of economics that, you know, people just... You see this is it's the same in, in in berlin and other cities now that it's just harder for kind of eccentric characters to exist uh, on the margins of, of of society yeah no I'd, I'd agree with that totally donald i think ultimately it's sad we've we've taken away a lot of like, I think, social safety nets you know you think of ireland you, you had a social safety net in terms of you didn't really have a two-tier health system if you go back and you didn't really have a two-tier education system and you you definitely didn't you had a housing system that could provide for people like bang bang and ultimately a lot of those we now have a heavily privatized uh, healthcare system. Is education still free? That's a big question. And, you know, there are high enough fees for university. And then when you bring housing in, that impacts on all the rest because ultimately, uh, you know, if you're from a working class family in Roscommon and you get a place in Trinity, um, even though you might be able to afford the fees, you won't be able to afford the rent. And um, we bring housing into that then on top, you know, are, you know, is a city a place that somebody who isn't engaged in gainful employment in inverted, com inverted commas, is that somewhere that they can exist? And it probably isn't. And that's the detriment of everybody. But then I see Mark Yates there with uh, is PJ from Sweeney's a living. Dub I think we can both testify that he is Dan. We had a, oh, a yeah. great evening in his in his company. Yeah, that <laughs> reminds me, PJ Murphy. Anyone who doesn't know PJ, he he maintains uh, Sweeney's Pharmacy, which is mentioned in 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 Ulysses. It's where Leopold Bloom buy, buys his uh, his lemon soap, and uh, he does it out of a love for Joyce. He's wearing the 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 white coat and, and he performs he, he sings uh, a couple of songs for people who drop in he can you know he reads Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake and everything else to visitors PJ is definitely a Dublin character you know he does what he does because he he loves doing it and uh, you can drop into Sweeney's pharmacy uh, anytime and, and PJ is there and I think yeah he's he's part of the furniture you kind of again you know there the, the, the quote earlier on from John Ryan about those fellows in Grafton Street lamenting how there were no Dublin characters, no three of them were Dublin characters. PJs are a reminder that they're, they're, they're still knocking around, certainly. And he still offers a barter system in the, in the, in the uh, dispensary. <laughs> uh, a few people sharing their own memories of Bang Bang. So someone says, I grew up on Leinster Street and remember Bang Bang and the grocery shop where the coffee shop is. It was called Fogacy. 
and some uh someone else says this is a this is lovely i was told bang bang would carry shopping for the women who lived around thomas street for tips and they would always call him thomas and never bang bang and um colin says i have vague memories of bang bang in the late 70s i seem to think he was a smoker and regularly had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth am i imagining that there would only have been seven or eight I have seen a photograph with him with him with a cigarette for sure. There isn't many photographs, but one of them he is, he does. So that I think he's probably correct there. Um, on the comment of Fogarty's, the, 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 the contributor there is totally correct. I don't remember it, but uh, where Bang Bang, the, the shop is now, was called Fogarty's. A lot of the older people around Fibbers remember it. And they said that Mr. Fogarty, uh, there was a phone line that went into the house. And each day his wife would call the phone to tell him his dinner would re was ready. <laughs> Put a sign on the door, go in and then return and open the shop again so you may remember that brilliant uh i think the ultimate question here from dave did bang bang support bows <laughs> I, think, I think definitely didn't everyone support bows really? <laughs> i see um evelyn's question on 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 james joyce uh the cinema was called the volta uh, it's where pennies is now uh on on uh, mary street it was a really good idea Unfortunately, it was a good idea way too early because there was kind of no film industry, even in, in Britain at the time. So Joyce was buying in reels that were aimed at Italian audiences. Now, they were silent movies, but they were still aimed at Italian audiences and they just didn't mean anything to Dubliners. So people kind of went along to see what a cinema was like and to see a, a, a film, but then they, they never really went back again once the novelty had worn off. But Joyce, it's funny you mentioned Joyce because I was only reading a, a biography of Joyce by Edna O'Brien, great great woman, great writer. But she says that one of the reasons Joyce left Dublin was that he was fearful of becoming a Dublin character, that he was broke. He was kind of, you know, wandering from, uh, from, from one failed occupation to the next, uh, wandering from one public house to the next and everything else. There was a lot of chatter about him uh, in town and his dad was a bit of a character. And Joyce, I think, felt that there was a risk in becoming a, a Dublin character. So like on one level, it's a, it's a lovely thing to be perhaps, but on another, there was a, a fear uh, of falling into into that hole. I think it was Joyce wanted to go to a bigger city where he'd be more anonymous. Thank you. Um, Jennifer is asking about those pictures you shared earlier of the electricity boxes. Uh, where are those, the ones with bang bang paintings on them? There's one in Cabra at the Bogies Park in Cabra and I'm pretty sure that's close to where the orphanage was originally. I think that's the rationale there. The other one, um, is on uh, just at the Grattan Bridge on the north side of the Grattan Bridge, just outside an old Bank of Ireland building there. And mm. um, it's worth mentioning, and uh, it's, it's really sad. The, that's remained there. It's really great. Donald mentioned that beta project is excellent. But the man who painted that is a local man to Fibsborough, uh, the late uh, Colin McGinley. Uh, Colin would have been no more than late 30s, I think. Um, I, got to, I, I didn't get to know him, but I interacted with him very briefly. Um, and he was a brilliant artist. And he sadly passed away uh, at a really young age. Uh, just a couple of years ago. I think the, the box would have went in maybe around 2015. I think Colin died about a year later. Um, but uh, the reason I, I kind of met Colin is he he did a brilliant design. People might know the, the murals in Daily Mount Park, and one of them is of Phil Linnet. And Colin contacted me to say he'd like to do a mural in Daily Mount, and he emailed me the PDF of of the drawing he'd done. It's really brilliant. And uh, and I contacted him to say, you know, would you like to do the painting? And he, and he said... Uh, you know, it was coming into winter time and um, maybe he'd wait till the spring. And when I called in the spring, his partner answered the phone and said he passed away. And uh, we got another artist, Nilo Lachlan, to, to do the drawing based on Colin's piece. So wow. um, just a little bit of other history there. It's great that that box has remained because Colin was a brilliant artist. And, and that, that picture of Bang Bang, it, it has a kind of an arrow flying over his head, which I think is reference to the cowboy and Indians. So uh, and a, bus, a bus underneath him. It's a, it's a fantastic, one of the best in Dublin, I think. And Matt Talbot on the other side, it's really, really nice. Really nice. Uh, Marie asks, where is your cafe? It's on uh, North Leinster Street. So it is, if you're coming into town, you cross the Royal Canal in Fibsborough mm -hmm. and it's the first right. And if you're going out of town, it's the last left before the Royal Canal. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think that might, be bringing us to the end. Um, Mark says he just wants to compliment uh, Tan on his modeling of the new Bose t-shirt. His is on the way with the new Fontaine's DC shirt. Um, Grace, so, I see on Kevin Kearns, that's, that's the correct spelling. Yeah, that's that's Kevin Kearns. Brilliant, thank you. Well, 
I guess um, all that remains is to thank you both so much for this evening. Really, really interesting. And I think um, uh, really uh, still obviously remembered really fondly by many people. Um, so thank you very much for, for, for that talk. It is being recorded as well. A couple of people are asking. So we will be sharing the recording um, over our social media channels at a later date. Um, and we have another Tea Time talk coming up on the... We get the date for you here on the 12th of April at 7 p.m. We've got Emma Clark from Dublin Ghost Signs, which is a photography project for old and fading signs. And that talk is on uncovering traces of Dublin's past through old and fading signs. And that's on 7 p.m. on the 12th of April. And you can book your um, ticket for that at the same place where you've got this one. It's 14 Henrietta Street .ie. Um, and um, that's free as well, like all of these talks are. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here with us this evening. And thank you again, Donal and Daniel, for a really, really interesting talk. Best of luck with all of, all of the work that you're doing. Um, and hopefully we will see um, all of you at more events in the future. Have a lovely evening.